Hey guys, and welcome to a new episode of Veil Lifted, a video essay where I discuss fascinating cases that involve secrecy and discovery. Today, we will be discussing the case of Conrad Henry Roy III and Michelle Carter, a case that is often referred to as the texting suicide case. In July of 2014, the mainstream media was constantly putting out more reports, more articles, and more videos about the case. It was highly controversial, and the topic of discussion on seemingly every social media platform. Why? Well, let's establish who Roy and Carter were and create a timeline. Conrad Henry Roy III was born in Massachusetts in 1995. He was a great student. He earned a captain's license from the Northeast Maritime Institute in 2014 and then graduated on the honor roll of his high school. In addition, he was a well-rounded athlete who was skilled in multiple sports. Though he'd been accepted to a university in order to study business, he opted to not go. Roy battled with mental illness, such as depression and social anxiety. He also was on a medication called Celexa, which, like many other antidepressants, can have the side effect of exemplifying suicidal thoughts and tendencies. His struggle was so severe that in 2012, he overdosed on paracetamol. Luckily, at the time of his overdose, he was speaking to a friend who called the police and his life was saved. Like most teens, Roy spent time online and actually recorded a video describing his feelings a month before his suicide. The hardest thing for me is to be comfortable in my own skin. Now I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. A lot of people tell me, a lot of people tell me that I have a lot going for me. I have to be happy, I have to be happy. Well no, you don't have to be happy. Your happiness comes from what your conscious what goes con happiness comes from your conscious thoughts and well being. It's you create your own happiness. And by you creating your own happiness, in a sense, you're in a society where you look at someone better off than you, happier, and you want to be jealous and envious of them for no it's just subconscious you just go when you're depressed you just go to place to place oh yeah this guy's happy this guy's you just point out wait the obvious but it's not real I am who I am. Yes, I can develop as a person, be more fluent, articulate, passionate about who I am. Or I can just go home, sit in my basement, and just do nothing about it. Just sit in my sorrows, weep and cry over something that is in the past. Or I can just take it one by one, a day by day, step by step. I mean, it's going to be difficult to accomplish, but I need to, for personal growth, accomplish this sense of self-pride in myself. Because depression or social, it can mean you don't like yourself. And the sooner I like myself, the better I'm going to be. Like, I have a lot going, I, I do have a lot going for me. Like, I'm like a fucking captain. I just got a job from the Boston Duck Tours to captain their boat. Like, that's a huge accomplishment. It'd be, to be a, a captain. Michelle Carter was born in Massachusetts in 1996. Carter lived a town over and therefore attended a different school, King Philip Regional High School. However, similarly to Roy, she struggled with mental illness. She had developed an eating disorder before the age of 10, as well as self-injury via cutting herself. Carter, too, was on medication and attended therapy as well. Though the two did not physically roam in the same circles, they shared many similar issues and both struggled. This may have been a reason why they gravitated towards each other. The 
two met in 2012 when on vacation visiting family in Florida. Though this encounter was in person, most of their relationship would be via text message, even though they only lived about 60 kilometers away from each other in the Boston area. In fact, it is lucky that their conversations were recorded, as they were key pieces of evidence used in court to ascertain if Carter was guilty. Guilty of what? Well, let's turn to the text messages. On June 19th, 2014, text messages between Carter and Roy went as follows. But the mental health hospital would help you. I know you didn't think it would, but I'm telling you, if you gave them a chance, they can save your life. Part of me wants you to try something and fail just so you can go get help. It doesn't help, trust me. So what are you gonna do then? Keep being all talk and no action every day? Go through saying how badly you wanna kill yourself? Or are you going to try to get better? I can't get better, I already made my decision. On June 23rd, 2014, again, Roy voices his wish to no longer be alive, again with Carter trying to reassure him and convince him to not take action. How do you want to harm yourself? Something I don't know yet. Please don't. I hate myself. I'll always hate myself. I'm never going to view myself as good. I'm so far behind. What is harming yourself going to do? Nothing. It will make it worse. Make the pain go away, like you said. It will make the pain go away temporarily, but when you're done, you'll just regret it and feel even worse. So far, Carter remained as supportive of Roy in a positive way, consistently trying to steer him away from taking negative action. The tide, however, shifted on July 7th. Initially, Roy asked Carter what she would do if in his position, to which Carter replied that she'd seek help. Later that day, however, Carter and Roy discuss ways in which to produce carbon monoxide. On July 8th, Carter's tone shifted Shifted dramatically. Instead of continuing to push for Roy to speak to his parents or reach out to a professional, this is how the conversation went. So are you sure you don't want to kill yourself tonight? What do you mean, am I sure? Like, are you definitely not doing it tonight? I don't know yet. I'll let you know. Because I'll stay up with you if you want to do it tonight. Another day wouldn't hurt. You can't keep pushing it off, though. That's all you keep doing. Here, it is important to note the specific vocabulary Carter uses along with the way in which her sentences are phrased. Initially, Carter applies pressure by asking whether Roy is sure he will not commit suicide that same night, and even asks twice. Then she adds time sensitivity to the situation by mentioning she'd stay up if he were to do it. This behavior is jarring because it negates all the prior sentiments that reminded Roy he could get through it. Now Carter has turned into an advocate for taking negative action. By using the terms pushing it off, the implication or even subtext is that of procrastination and perhaps even laziness or lack of supposed courage. It is also important to note that at this point, Roy clearly showed to have suicidal thoughts subsiding as he claimed another day alive wouldn't hurt along with the fact that he said he didn't know if he'd take action. The two continued to discuss the best methodology in which to conduct the suicide. On July 11th, Carter goes as far as to suggest that Roy use the generator as it quote unquote cannot fail. Between July 4th and 12th, the pair continued to discuss the potential plan and strategy in which to end Roy's life. In these days, Carter's shift towards a more aggressive and malevolent tone only grow louder. It is clear that Roy was considering continuing to live and either postponing or canceling his plan entirely. However, Carter continuously pestered him. Here are some examples. You're gonna have to prove me wrong because I don't think you really want this. You just keep pushing it off to another night and you say you'll do it, but you never do. But I bet you're gonna be like, oh, it didn't work because I didn't tape the tube right or something like that. I bet you're gonna say an excuse like that. Do you have the generator? Not yet, lol. Well, when are you getting it? You better not be bullshitting me and saying you're gonna do this and then purposely get caught. Between July 11th and 12th, Roy texts Carter about his concerns about how his family might react to his suicide, stating he wouldn't want them to feel guilt or depression because of his act. Throughout this entire timeline of events, Roy continues to voice his uncertainty, often represented in text saying, I'm overthinking this. In response to Roy's concerns, Carter stated, I think your parents know you're in a really bad place. I'm not saying they want you to do it, but I honestly feel like they can accept it. They know there's nothing they can do. They've tried helping. Everyone's tried. But there's a point that comes where there isn't anything anyone can do to save you, not even yourself, and you've hit that point, and I think your parents know you've hit that point. You said your mom saw a suicide thing on your computer and she didn't say anything. I think she knows it's on your mind and she's prepared for it. Everyone will be sad for a while, but they will get over it and move on. They won't be in depression, I won't let that happen. They know how sad you are and they know you're doing this to be happy and I think they will understand and accept it. They'll always carry you in their hearts. Carter tried to comfort Roy by mentioning that she'd be there for his family, a primary point of worry, and also a reason why he consistently stepped back from killing himself. On the 12th of July, Roy again expresses uncertainty and is met with aggressive remarks from Carter. So I guess you're not gonna do it then. 
all that for nothing. I'm just confused, like you were so ready and determined. I'm gonna eventually. I really don't know what I'm waiting for, but I have everything lined up. No, you're not, Conrad. Last night was it. You keep pushing it off and you'll say you'll do it, but you never do. It's always gonna be that way if you don't take action. You're just making it harder on yourself by pushing it off. You just have to do it. Do you wanna do it now? Is it too late? I don't know, it's already light outside. I'm gonna go back to sleep. Love you, I'll text you tomorrow. No, it's probably the best time now because everyone's sleeping. Just go somewhere in your truck and no one's really out right now because it's an awkward time. If you don't do it now, you're never gonna do it. And you can say you'll do it tomorrow, but you probably won't. It's interesting to know that Carter used terms such as nothing and never along with ready and determined. It seems as though she created a strict binary for Roy and that he had to kill himself or live miserably rather than seeking help via therapy and perhaps a change in medication. Additionally, Carter took advantage of Roy's uncertainty by guilting him for consistently opting out of his plan to kill himself. Carter even had gone as far as to give Roy detailed direct Directions about how to make sure he would in fact die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah, it will work. If you emit 3,200 ppm of it for five or 10 minutes, you will die within a half hour. You lose consciousness with no pain. You just fall asleep and die. You can also just take a hose and run that from the exhaust pipe to the rear window in your car and seal it with duct tape and shirts so it can't escape. You will die within like 20 or 30 minutes all pain-free. Finally, to make sure he would commit suicide, Carter asked Roy to promise her that he would. Here is that exchange. You just need to do it, Conrad, or I'm gonna get you help. You can't keep doing this every day. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Do you promise? I promise, babe. I have to now. Like right now, where do I go? And you can't break a promise, just go in a quiet parking lot or something. It is interesting that only at this very moment did Carter offer to quote unquote help, though in this context, it seems more like a threat than a life-saving gesture. This was to be their last exchange. Roy died in his car. An exchange between Carter and a friend two months after Roy's death would end up being crucial in the case. Carter admitted that Roy got out of the car, scared as he'd begun feeling the effects of the carbon monoxide, and Carter told him to get back in. Carter also told a friend that Roy had called her and she'd heard muffled sounds, but that Roy wasn't speaking to her. She eventually was sentenced to 2.5 years for involuntary manslaughter. They ended up being reduced to 15 months with a five year probation. In the end, she barely served 12 months. She got an early release due to good behavior. Unsurprisingly, this case opened a national debate on whether she was to blame at all, partially or fully for Roy's suicide. In fact, documentaries, episodes, and telefilms were made about the controversial case. In the HBO documentary, I Love You Now Die, The Commonwealth vs. Michelle Carter, they address thousands of texts and analyze the situation along with hearing Carter's defense. A large part of Carter's defense was based on the testimony of Dr. Peter Bregan, a psychiatrist. Bregan focused a bulk of his testimony on the fact that, like Roy, Carter took the medication Celexa, which, as mentioned prior, can have the side effect of increased risk of suicide in those under 24. In his opinion, Celexa caused a switch in Carter's behavior, though it remains unclear how a switch occurred and which attributes of hers were affected or unaffected and why. While this side effect point remains factual, he also added that in his opinion, Carter was trying to help Roy by releasing him from his pain. Needless to say, this explanation did not resonate with much of the public and felt like a cop-out. Additionally, Bregan went on to say that she was very vulnerable and struggling with her own suicidal thoughts. To add fuel to the fire, Bregan made the questionable choice to imply that Roy was the one manipulating Carter and that this resulted, along with the medication, in a glamorized idea of a Romeo and Juliet scenario. To further convince the court of Carter's benevolence, he said, she's a helper. Her whole life is helping everybody. She's the biggest helper. She lives to help people and make them happy. The image Dr. Bregan painted of Michelle Carter, that of a troubled young girl doing her best to help her boyfriend, did not convince the court. In fact, when exposed to even more texts that she sent her friends before Roy's death was confirmed, her statements show she wasn't entirely truthful. She messaged her friend the following. He told me that day he went to the store to get a generator for work. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but on the phone I heard a motor running, which I thought was the generator. I just looked it up online and it said they are dangerous and fatal because they give off carbon monoxide. You can die within 20 minutes with that thing. I think he poisoned himself and it's all my fault. I'm so stupid. I should have known that's what he's doing. I'm so fucking stupid. I don't even know what to do. The implication in this text is that she was completely unaware of Roy's plan to the point that she only then had looked up a generator and saw it could cause death. However, it is a proven fact that she had texted him giving in him instructions on exactly how to kill himself using a generator. Granted, this interaction was with a friend and perhaps she didn't want to admit anything. But if she did want to help him, why would she be scared to admit it? Perhaps 
perhaps because she knew others wouldn't see it that way, or perhaps because she knew how she'd be perceived, or both. The larger discussion that came from this tragedy was in regards to the free speech element. Were Carter's thoughts and speech crimes? Could she really be imprisoned for using her free speech to voice her support of his suicide plan? Could her giving him instructions on how to use a generator to kill himself be punished? Well, the argument could go both ways. In one way, Carter was simply telling Roy what was on her mind and giving him tips. Those acts are not illegal, and being punished would also imply that Carter was responsible for the acts of another, Roy. On the other hand, to tell a suicidal person to go through with it to the point of pressuring them is manipulative and morally corrupt. However, for many, this moral corruption was noted but not as an offense that is punishable by law. In fact, the court did say Carter failed to act as she knew when and where Roy would commit the act, and yet she did not call the authorities or try to intervene in a situation in which she had a significant role. This debate on free speech also took a slippery slope turn, where people began to question if Carter was a criminal for what she said, how could we regulate speech? How does a law even create parameters for what can be said to who and when? The judge, Judge Moniz, found that Roy had been clearly thinking about planning on suicide and that while Carter encouraged it, the idea was his to begin with. That idea, however, came to a halt when he began the poisoning process and got out of the truck. He broke the chain of events until Carter told him to get back in. In a Harvard Law Review article going over the case, they state that the judge, Moniz, reason for the verdict could have been simpler. Carter's constant pressuring and final command to get back in overwhelmed Roy's free will such that she was responsible for him getting back into the truck. Grounding the decision in this reasoning would have made it clear that there is a high threshold for imposing and criminal liability on the encouragement of suicide, curtailing free speech fears. This way of framing the situation clarifies that free speech is not necessarily the central focus, but rather simply a part of what made Carter guilty. In the end, Carter was released from her 11 months in jail on January 23rd. Since then, very little has come out about her, what her future plans are, how she's doing, and so forth. It would not be surprising if she wanted to remain out of the public eye permanently, considering she is now notorious and her name always will be. In the end, all that can be hoped for is that the Roy family is healing and that they feel a sense of closure in knowing the case is over and knowing many around the world support them and Conrad. My personal opinion about this case, I feel is relatively popular. This case fuels such a rage in me that I actually took longer to write this script than I have many others because I have a bias. I've been suicidal, I have overdosed, so I know what that's like. In my opinion, Michelle Carter is guilty because yes, while Roy made the decisions he made, at the same time, there were many times when he pulled back from those decisions. So anytime he decided to go to bed and think about it and live another day, he was actively saying no to suicide. And to have someone who, instead of being happy about it and encouraging you to keep this going and to keep pushing this back as much as possible until you're happy enough to just live life or until you change medication or until therapy works out for you, but to have someone that instead says, no, why are you killing yourself? Why are you lagging? What she was implying is that he was almost being lazy by continuously postponing. In and of itself is deeply fucked up, but aside from that, the fact that she told him to get back in the truck to me is undeniable proof that there is something seriously wrong with her and I hope she is getting psychiatric help in regards to that specifically, let alone the self-harm and the eating disorder. As much as her psychiatrist wanted to play this off as she's so good she thought death would deliver him from this pain, First of all, I don't buy that. Also, I strongly suggest watching the HBO documentary because his defense is laughable when he says that this was her way of making sure he'd be okay. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't because it's such a base explanation. If Carter was so strongly affected by Celexa that she had a shift, but nobody noticed this shift and the only person she projected this shift onto was her boyfriend, I suppose that's possible, but it's very hard to believe. And Dr. Bregan made a terrible argument, so I suppose my bias shows more because like I said, I already thought she was guilty anyway, but his argument was so weak that it almost made her look guiltier by definition. I think she should have had more time in prison because someone who is so blasé about someone killing themselves to the point where they're talking about instructions and directions, there's something really wrong and I think someone like that is dangerous. Putting myself in this situation, if when I had suicidal ideation, which has happened multiple times in my life, if I had a someone there who in that moment of frantic misery, I suppose, if I had someone there being like, yeah, do it, 
slit your veins open. Would I have done it? I don't know, but it's more likely. Even though it seems like it's useless to tell people don't kill yourself, stay around, blah blah blah. It has an impact whether you see it or not. In the same way, if you tell someone, yeah, nothing's ever gonna get better, just kill yourself already. It's stupid to pretend that that doesn't have an impact. Of course, Roy did make several choices, but I also feel like if there's someone consistently manipulating and pressuring you, the choices you make are not entirely yours anymore. I think Michelle Carter is a terrible person. I think she should stay in prison longer. I think 11 months is laughable. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Do you think she's guilty? How guilty do you think she is? Please let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons as always, and I'll catch you guys next time.